I am introducing today um, Scott W. Berg, the author of 38 Nooses, Lincoln, Little Crow, and the Beginning of the Frontier's End. Um, it's the story of the summer of 1862 with the Dakota Wars in Minnesota, a war that was very significant in our country's history, but was virtually invisible because of the Civil War going on and occupying our presidents and our generals' time. Um, it also was involved um, the largest scale execution in U.S. history. Um, our author, Scott Berg, is a native Minnesotan, the location of the events in this book. He teaches creative writing at George Mason University, is a contributor to the Washington Post, and um, is the author of a prior book about Washington, D.C., called The Story of Pierre Charles L'Enfant, the French visionary, visionary who designed Washington, D.C., um, which is in, on sale in our book tent. Um, Scott Berg will be signing in the author's area down here after the, um, after the presentation. I have to talk about the book for me. Um, I volunteered to be assigned a book to read, and when I saw that it was a very scholarly, with lots of references, book on um, history, I'm not particularly a history buff, I'm not particularly a Civil War buff, Yet, from page one, I was completely mesmerized. This is an incredible story that, that more people should know about. It's not a proud time in United States history. Um, and I learned so much. Our author has taken what is very, I don't know how he did his research, because you know it's not like you can hear videotapes or see films of some of the um, Little Crow the Indian chief, the Dakota chief, who is very much a central character in this book, of Lincoln and his involvement with the Indian Wars, which basically he didn't want to be involved because the Civil War was going on and taking his attention. So anyway, but he makes every one of the characters in this book vibrant, alive. You care about them. You care what happens to them. And it's a very disturbing moment in our, um, in our history um, you draw your own moral conclusions in reading the book, and it's not, it's not a good time for America. But um, if any, don't be scared of you know, reading this piece of scholarly history, because it reads like the most exciting novel. And I loved reading it, and I love introducing Scott W. Berg, our author. Thank you so much, Joanne. And, and for those very kind words, and thank you all for being here on this sort of overcast day. Um, we at George Mason, where I teach, we run a book festival that's not concurrent with this one. It's called Fall for the Book. It happens in September. Um, we're growing fast. This book festival is growing fast. There's a book festival down in the mall, as you well know, every fall. This is a wonderful area for this, and what I really enjoy is because we are su such an author-rich area and because uh, and because these festivals do such a good job of carving out their own niche, you don't hear the same voices every time. So it's wonderful for me not only to be here, but to sort of see all the other authors who are here and see the mix of authors. And this, this great thing you have set up here where you can just drop into a tent um, and listen and then drop into another tent and listen. So thank you all. Thank to all the organizers. Thanks to Joelle. And what I want to do here is this is a story that, I mean, I grew up in Minnesota, as Joel mentioned. Uh, moved out to the Washington, D.C. area 20 years ago, so I've been here a while. I've been teaching at George Mason almost all that time. And when I grew up in Minnesota, this thing called the Dakota War was part of our history, but in my high school, in my elementary school, in my junior high, uh, we didn't cover it. If we covered it, we covered it for a day, and I don't remember it um, being covered. And yet, as soon as I started doing a lot of writing about history, books and writing for the Washington Post about history and writing for other venues about history, um, you know, in the back of my head I had this, uh, this memory of, well, there's this thing called the Dakota War. And if you're in Minnesota, the history that you're given has to do with the Voyagers and, the, and all the Scandinavians who, who sort of settle there and the Minnesota Vikings, the Minnesota Twins, and uh, a certain kind of progressive politics. But this event, the Dakota War that occurs in 1862, 
occurs when the state is only, it's a frontier state, it's a northwestern frontier state, very, very much the frontier. I mean, Chicago was sort of considered the, the, you know, the edge of the world then for many people in the East, and this is beyond that, well beyond that. Um, a frontier story, and the state is only four years old at the time, and there's all the politi political sort of machinations that go into making a state, but this story of the Dakota War is sort of the true origin story of where I'm from, but it's not just a local story. One of the the efforts in this book is really to understand that this was a national story, and I'll be sort of giving you the flavor of it here in a second. I, I want to be efficient with my time here because I know there is a lot else to see. So what I want to do here is give you a flavor of the book by reading a very short excerpt. And then I want to talk your way through a couple different things that Joellen actually mentioned. I want to talk your way through the basic events of this. Um, sort of frame it for you. And then I do want to talk uh, about a f just a few of the central characters in here, the sort of kaleidoscope of people involved in this, and ultimately the way they're all remarkably connected. Um, so what I want to do first here, uh, before I even talk about these events, is read uh, from just the introduction. It's a short introduction. Read this to you, take about 10 minutes with this. and. Um, the introduction doesn't start with the Dakota War. It jumps back almost 100 years earlier than the Civil War and uh, to a farm in uh, Kentucky, which wasn't a state yet uh, then in 1786, um, but a connection to a very famous American uh, family here. On the bright May afternoon in 1786, when his family would be shattered and the course of his newborn country forever altered, Mordecai Lincoln was 15 years old. The Lincolns lived on the frontier in the far western portion of Virginia, a region called Kentucky, most likely from a Wyandotte or Iroquoian word meaning land of tomorrow or place of meadows. They were pioneers, and like all pioneers in the Ohio River Valley during the late 18th century, they were lucky just to be alive. Four years earlier, the Lincoln family had crossed through the Cumberland Gap following a trail first blazed by Daniel Boone, and today Mordecai and his brothers, Josiah 13 and Thomas 8, were assisting their father as he enclosed a cornfield, working to carve out an ever larger pocket of civilization on a parcel of land beside Long Run, a branch of a branch of a branch of the Ohio River, east of the new settlement of Louisville. As the boys helped to position the top rail of a new fence, a shot sounded. Their father tumbled to the ground, and out of the woods emerged two or three Indians. Mordecai picked up his father's rifle and barked at Josiah to run as fast as he could to the community stockade called Hughes Station, 15 minutes distant to sound the alarm. Josiah ran, and so did Mordecai, who reached the cabin his father had built just as he heard his other brother cry out. He turned to see Thomas, grasped by the hair and trousers being carried toward the tree line. Mordecai required only a moment's look, and perhaps not even that, to know that the Indians didn't intend to kill Thomas. They intended to take him. Mordecai leveled his gun and aimed for a sun glint of metal in the late afternoon sun, a half-moon pendant dangling against the chest of his brother's would-be captor. The teenager's aim was remarkable. That, or luck was with him. The Indian went down, his companions vanished. Thomas was unhurt. Many years later, Thomas's son Abraham, risen higher in the world than any member of the Lincoln clan could ever have dared imagine, would call this story the legend more strongly than all others imprinted upon my mind and memory. Abraham Lincoln, namesake of his murdered grandfather, would never say much about his own early years in Kentucky embarrassed into a lifetime of silence by his family's shiftlessness and poverty. Yet this story of his grandfather killed by Indians was told often enough and in enough detail that Lincoln's longtime law partner, William Herndon, collecting a book's worth of reminiscences of the late president, was able to record no fewer than six versions from four different tellers, all second and third hand accounts tracing back to Thomas or Mordecai. Like so many pieces of frontier color, the Lincoln's tale of death and attempt attempted abduction was the story of westward expansion in miniature, tightly intertwined with breathless assumptions about the savagery of Indians and the march of civilization. 
For Abraham Lincoln, it was nothing less than the bedrock of the log cabin posturing that had helped to push him toward the highest office in the land. Owing to my father being left an orphan at the age of six years in poverty and in a new country, he wrote in 1848 during his single term as a